Under the sea, under the sea. Darling, it's better down where it's weather. Take it from me! Ugh. What have I done? Oh my god, she's dead. I can escape justice forever on my floating bungalow. I never really anticipated this when I started the show, but places to live or vacation at have become a recurring part of our programming. We've covered Potemkin villages, big cities, small towns, underground communities, and even a variety of intriguing lakes by which you may or may not wish to build a cottage. In this episode, we're going to be turning our eyes oceanward to look at seasteading. The basic idea of seasteading is to try and live permanently at sea, whether on a giant boat, oil rig kind of platform, or even a series of platforms. Now, seasteading also involves making a point of living outside the legal jurisdiction of any recognized nations. Obviously, there is also the appeal of simply living at sea, but when you look at the kinds of individuals who pursue or even manage to achieve a seasteading lifestyle, you're pretty much always going to find a very strong libertarian streak in them. When I first wrote this episode, I accidentally wrote a very strong libertarian steak, and I'm okay with that. This is pretty understandable, given that most libertarians' anti-government beliefs basically mean they want people to be their own island. Now, it's true, you could use that lack of international law to pursue all sorts of curious utopian social experiments. But, well, let's just take a look at the number one investor in California's own Seasteading Institute, PayPal founder Peter Thiel. Before he came along, the Institute had raised enough funds to buy a pair of sea dues, but Peter added a nice juicy five on the end of that number because he felt that democracy had been dead in the United States since the 1920s when the vast increase in welfare beneficiaries and the extension of the franchise to women, two constituencies that are notoriously tough for libertarians, have rendered the notion of capitalist democracy into an oxymoron. Basically, things got shitty when the government decided to help the poor and to allow women to vote. Basically, it sounds like Peter would like to live in a seaborne version of the 19th century. More than extreme weather, having to be self-sustaining, dealing with pirates, having to raise funds or deal with public skepticism, or governments who aren't particularly fond of little micronations forming just outside their legal boundaries, seasteaders themselves pose the greatest obstacle to seasteading. While there are certainly plenty of individuals who want to do good things with seasteading, it seems that this is always going to be catnip to the kind of individual who couldn't share their Halloween candy when they were a kid, and who currently walk around with a heavily stained, much-loved photograph of Ayn Rand in their back pocket. So far, the only seasteading community to survive for longer than it takes to play through Bioshock on hard mode is the Principality of Sealand, a micronation that sits off the coast of England and was a British sea fortress that was abandoned in 1956. Colonized 11 years later by English Major Roy Paddy Bates and his family, this seasteading community never did get its pirate radio station off the ground, which was supposedly its original purpose. However, they did have their own flag, currency, and passports. That last item having to be discontinued by 1990 due to the hundreds of fake Sealand passports floating around. They were also invaded and taken over in 1978. This being made mostly possible by the fact that 66.6% .6 of the nation's population were lured away by inviting all two of them to Austria for a fictional business deal. Funny enough, the coup was organized by their own prime minister. Bates's family were the Sealand royals a German expatriate named Alexander Aschenbach. However, Roy Bates soon took back his country, using only a shotgun and the help of his friend John Crudson, who lent a lot of cinematic awesomeness to the ordeal by being a helicopter stunt pilot that regularly worked on James Bond films. Luckily, nobody was killed or injured, and the family then lived for many more years peacefully on sea land, until eventually they left the country to a friend and moved to Spain, which is presumably a lot harder to invade. Now, I know I've not really given any attention to the scientific or environmental concerns and possibilities of seasteading, but this is because I feel that the inherent instability caused by the lack of social constraints and the fringe types attracted by that lack blot out any of those possibilities or concerns. I mean, really, what's the point in building an engineering marvel only to have it turn into a fanfiction crossover between Lord of the Flies and Sequest? Sealand is pretty okay, but I'd rather there be a principality of SeaWorld. Just a swell old nation of killer whales and the dolphins that love them. Smooth, erotic water mammals making interspecies whoopee in a swirling orgy of <coughs> and <coughs> That's a whale song. An erotic whale song. You don't know enough about him. Introducing Sean McLean. Sean McLean, seriously, seriously. Sean McLean is viewable from most angles, but some angles are more viewable than others. These include 38 degrees and sitting on the couch. 
Sometimes in the bathroom, you might comment that the tiles look like Sean McLean from a 45 degree angle. You'd be incorrect. You've just learned a little bit more about Sean McLean.